start off by apologizing for the lack of heat in the room, but hopefully our, your warm presence will uh, raise the temperature a bit. Um, I see a lot of people have jackets, so that's good. I, I was just informed that they're having some issue with the heat, so it may or may not become warmer. Um, good evening and welcome. My name is Josh Owen. I am the Vignelli Distinguished Professor of Design and Director of the Vignelli Center for Design Studies. Tonight marks the first event of our Spring 24 Vignelli Design Conversations Lecture Series, presented by Design Milk and RIT's Magic Center, and made possible in part by the generosity of RIT alumnus Chris Bailey and Bailey Brand Consulting. I'd like to begin by offering my thanks to RIT's Magic Center and their team of faculty, staff, and students, as well as our interpreters for this evening, Lauren Berger and Samantha Geffen, for their work. I would also like to recognize the thoughtful work of my esteemed colleague, School of Design visiting lecturer, Javier Viramontes, for his powerful and poetic branding for tonight's lecture series and for the series moving forward. His conceptual focus on the topic of ambiguity aligns with the fascinating area of the Vignelli philosophy as well as with our tactical interests in attracting interest and keeping our materials aligned with our goals. Javier engaged visual communications master's student Samara Sudhir to help further develop his work into the motion graphic piece that you see on the screen behind us. Thank you both for extending the Vignelli ethos by using it for inspiration with your important contribution to our work here, Javier and Samara. <laughs> Rochester Institute of Technology's Vignelli Center for Design Studies is an international hub for education, research, collaboration, and advocacy, which expands the scope of the programs in the College of Art and Design School of Design. The facility houses the archive of renowned designers, Lella and Massimo Vignelli, whose works are icons of international design. The center and archives sit within RIT's College of Art and Design, which was built on the traditional territory of the Onondaga, or People of the Great Hill. In English, they are known as Seneca people, keepers of the Western Door. They are one of the six sovereign nations that make up the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, we honor the land on which RIT was built and recognize the unique relationship that the indigenous stewards have with this land. That relationship is the core of their traditions, cultures, and histories. We recognize the history of genocide, colonization, and, and assimilation of indigenous people that took place on this land. Mindful of these histories, we work towards understanding, acknowledging, and reconciling. As stewards of history and content, we must acknowledge and seek to learn from our context, bad, good, ugly, and beautiful. This applies to the Vignelli Center as with any archive. The Vignellis taught us that design is a systematic framework for solving the world's most intractable problems. If recent times have taught us anything, it's that while we as humans are adaptable, our societies and systems continue to have significant flaws. We are at a point when we need to have difficult discussions and work to create a new balance in the world. In this, design must play a critical role. As a director, I aim to make the Vignelli Center even more accessible and applicable by bringing in stimulating guest contributors from diverse and often underrepresented backgrounds who help us to consider design in innovative ways. The Vignelli's design is one philosophy leaves us with a universal message that design is a lens through which we can envision a more inclusive and more sustainable tomorrow. This evening, we are delighted to welcome distinguished designer and educator Jonathan Wayscall to the lectern to present his talk entitled Simplicity and Complexity, Emotions in Design. Jonathan Wayscall is an Italian-born designer who has been based in New York City for much of his professional career although his work experience and creative reach extends to Europe, Asia, and beyond. Some of his clients include Pirelli Industrial Products, the Smithsonian Institution, El Museo del Barrio, Con Edison, 
the Rockefeller Foundation, the Japan Society, the Whitney Museum, and the Guggenheim Museum. He teaches popular courses at the New School Parsons in New York City, and he's the author of the masterful book, Design Ways Call. This publication describes an extensive range of projects created by his studio over the last 25 years. The result is a visually driven experience that emphasizes a consistent design approach across all categories of design. The work ranges from editorial design to identities, wayfinding, product design, interactive design, and information graphics. The book highlights 50 projects and spans three continents. A collection of essays by notable design historians, educators, and theorists, among them design legend Massimo Vignelli, and new recent Rochesterian, Jan Conradi, who's with us tonight, situate uh, the work of Design Way Skull within the modernist tradition. We can, uh, excuse me, having worked in the Vignelli's office during his early career, we can easily refer to Jonathan as a designer extending the praxis the Vignelli's championed with their holistic philosophy, Design is One. It is important for us to, in the center to remember the legacy of the Vignelli's work, and there's no better way to do this than to hear from people who learn directly from working with them. I'm honored to call Jonathan both a respected colleague and a dear friend. Please join me in a warm Vignelli Center welcome for the intellectually elegant Jonathan Wayskull. Josh, thank you so much for the lovely introduction. I always look for excuses to come up here uh, in Rochester, and it's, uh, it's always wonderful to be here at the Vignelli Center for Design Studies and breathe the air of the Vignelli designs. I also would like to extend thank yous to Javier Viramontes for the fantastic posters. Uh, there's nothing as powerful as a black dot in the center of a page on an orange background. And uh, it's really the power of the center. And yes, uh, since you picked up on the orange, I have to say a few words about that. Um, it's definitely my favorite color for a number of reasons. It is um, a very happy color. It is a positive and a joyful and optimistic color. But also, growing up, I realized that uh, all books of design had the orange spine. So I always had a close connection to design with this color. And uh, uh, throughout my career, I, I persuaded many of my clients to use a lot of orange. And it turned, to be effective, turned out to be effective. Uh, let me switch to this uh, beautiful, and thank you for this uh, introduction, uh, it's terrific. So let me go to my presentation here. Uh, okay. Oops. Uh, here we go. Uh, so tonight, um, I would like to, I prepared this talk combining things that are on the minds of uh, uh, designers, and that is, is uh, and, and I hope is a stimulating, stimulating subject, and uh, it's, it's uh, what is on my mind, certainly, uh, uh, w whenever we have projects, we are dealing with content, paring down information, and how to make it effective, and generate emotional reactions, and hopefully, uh, generating memor memorable communications. So, um, so all of these ideas, I decided to uh, show them in context of a designer that uh, along with Massimo Vignelli was another mentor of mine. His name was Aji Fronzoni. And uh, um, so I will be talking about Aji Fronzoni as well as obviously I will make references to Massimo Vignelli uh, 
since, uh, well, we are here in this context of the Vignelli Center for Design Study, it makes a lot of sense. And uh, does anybody know uh, the name A.G. Fronzoni? Only a few. Okay. I expected that. Uh, so I will introduce to you uh, an amazing designer, and I will be talking about him a little bit. But um, I want to start with a subject uh, talking about neuroscience and design and imaging technology. But there's been a convergence of, of uh, basic understanding from design to science and vice versa. And it is fascinating to me to learn about the progress and knowledge and the scientific evidence we now have. This knowledge, on the one hand, provides us with clues on how our mind works, and uh, uh, on the other, validates intuitive perceptions that, um, uh, that we have as, as designers. So while most of us designers uh, may not be versed into neuroscience, we're great observers and practitioners. As, as practitioners, we learn things by doing, teaching, experimenting. And so I will share uh, some of what I believe is relevant relating to emotions and visual perceptions. Uh, uh, going back to 2005, uh, I was working for Siemens Corporation on a number of projects, and I was hired to, to design uh, this monograph for a unit that uh, Siemens is proud uh, of maintaining, which is a, uh, a uh, uh, Siemens is one of the few companies, actually, that uh, still has a group of researchers that uh, just do that. And uh, they may not, uh, they, they might uh, occasionally have some com commercial applications, but not necessarily. So the biggest thing at the time was imaging technology. It was just when they were unveiling equipment of, the, of uh, imaging technology. So through this break, breaking ground imaging technology machines, scientists were able to do all kinds of research. And so I was very well aware of the fact that these new technology were instrumental for science of creating and finding more information about our brains. Um, something that could not have been possible prior. When I went to their headquarters and saw the outcome of this new imaging technology machine, I was completely blown away. And so I requested some of the material from my work. These images generated, they were cranking out hundreds of these amazing visuals. And of course, the scientists were looking for certain information. And I was looking at these from an artistic standpoint. And uh, so, just as, as beautiful art. So I got rid of all of the badly dressed scientists leaning uh, next to their desk and next to their computers and replaced from, from previous uh, publications and replaced all of the images with the spectacular content that was generated. So this looked like a Jackson Pollock. And in fact, it's, uh, it's just the visualization of our blood vessels in the brain. So I, so this is uh, these are some uh, uh, some pages inside, and um, so just last year, um, I, I was uh, as as I've been thinking a lot about the effects and the emotions in people for a long time. I was called by. Uh, this, this guy, David de Ruzon, who is the founder of the master's program of, in neuroscience and architecture at the Luav University in Architecture in Venice. And he invited me to participate in a symposium with uh, some neuroscientists and, and talking about memory and emotions in design. Uh, th this idea, uh, so, so the, the ideas for this talk pretty much came from all of this information that I had. And um, uh, this master's program was just started in 2019, so it's a relatively new field. 
uh, in architecture and design. And I believe this all thinking about uh, validating what, what we now know about the brain and how we react with design and visuals and architecture uh, sheds light for new and elevate, uh, can elevate design, design criticism at different levels. And I know how much the Vignellis believe and care about design criticism. So uh, one of the quotes that came out of uh, uh, this discussion was uh, based on Louis Sullivan, uh, Form Follows Function, <clears throat> and this Indian American architect, Sushi Reddy, coined a new quote, and she called, she said, form follows feeling. And I like this idea of form follows feeling very much. Um, so now I'm going to jump to the other, it's fantastic to see this. This, this is the best screen ever. Um, so uh, here, uh, this section of my presentation is about uh, Agi Fronzoni. And um, uh, his name was Angelo Giuseppe Fronzoni, but this is the way that he would like us to, to, to write it. Uh, there is no punctuation, because the punctuation would be redundant, and everything is lowercase, it's very minimal, it's at the corner, upper corner of the page. So Fronzoni is a mentor, just like Massimo is. He's a model of integrity and a major source of inspiration. I learned about Fronzoni from a talented design assistant of mine, also called Massimo. His name is Massimo Canali, a protege of Fronzoni. So I met Fronzoni in his studio in Via Solferino in Milan and became instantly fascinated by his world. It became a habit that every time in Milan I was going to visit him, <coughs> I would call him up and promptly he would answer the phone. Pronto chi parla? Who is talking? And I said, hi, I'm Jonathan Baiskol. I'm here in Milan visiting. Can you come here in half an hour? Sure. So I made my Luckily, Milan is not as large as New York, and I could make it in half an hour and go to visit him. <coughs> then later, he came to visit me in, uh, in my studio in New York. So we saw each other quite a bit. Uh, so while Fronzoni has been recognized by some of the most prestigious institutions in the field of design, to this day, he is largely unknown. So I wasn't surprised that uh, you don't know his name. Uh, I also thought that he was a good example to talk about because, uh, because of his extreme minimalism could be memorable and emotional. The legendary Milanese architect and designer Pierluigi Cerri, who said, I am interested in forms that survive history declared that Fronzoni was one of the biggest talents in graphic design in the 20th century. Stephen Heller, one of the most uh, famous writers of graphic design, wrote an article in print magazine in 2016 titled, Agi Fronzoni Revived Again. Uh, and then he said, uh, I only learned of his work many years after his death and I regret having missed the opportunity to meet him. I like the idea of the title of uh, Heller, Revived Again, because that's a sign of timelessness. It's, uh, Fronzoni is being rediscovered and rediscovered time and time again. So I think that uh, from time to time there are people in the field that are radical. They're so firm in their beliefs and ahead of their times. So from extreme points of view, sometimes almost utopic approaches, we learned a lot, and our profession is pushed forward onto new uncharted territory, and new languages of communication. So one master that influenced designers was Agi Fronzoni. Uh, he believed in an extreme minimalism 
so minimal to the point of displaying the absolute essential, creating communications that would at times be somewhat cryptic in order to engage with the reader at a deeper level. He broke barriers because he was going against conventions that at the time people still respected. Uh, so, in 1965, Fronzoni was in, uh, invited to become the art director of Casabella. Casabella is uh, a very important uh, uh, design magazine, uh, architecture magazine, and he was breathing the air of the exposure of the Italian rationalist, particularly Pagano and Persico from the 1930s. And according to uh, Franco Achilli, who is a scholar and uh, he, he knew Fronzoni very well, at the time he discovered who he really was and started his methodology of subtraction. And at the time, he also became radical in the way that he did design. And uh, he started just working with black and white and also only sans serif type. Uh, he felt that color was too much of an easy trick. Uh, he, he said, color is a distraction. È un imbroglio is the trick. It distracts from the main concept, and it is like cheating. By sugarcoating and impressing with color, one loses focus on what really matters. So this is a poster for a convention of museums. And uh, the content becomes the content itse itself. There is nothing else other than the information needed. <coughs> In its quiet elegance, he is going outside of the conventions, disregarding the traditional minimum space that is left at the printer, pr printing margins and goes right up to the, super close to the edge of the paper with the type. This is an enormous tension by placing the type with such an extre extreme edge, and as a result, he created, he's creating a visually powerful poster. So I, um, this is uh, something that he said about uh, uh, about typography. Typography, the field where I constantly practice my profession, is one of the most significant code to prove that signs are able to convey content themselves, as long as they are as essential as possible. According to Michelangelo, sculpting and subtracting, typography is a discipline that shows the same attitude. The more is taken away, carved from the sign, the more the sign conveys. I entrust the decisive task, the empty space that has not uh, to be intended as lack of information, but of moment of significance. Uh, I created this slide just to illustrate something that I had a conversation with, uh, with Franzoni about uh, he, how he felt about uh, serif and sans serif, and he said, if an architect, a modern contemporary architect, designs a house today, he would not use an ionic column, of course. It would be a simple cylinder. So why, why have the serif if you're a modern designer? Mm. Um, and mm. so he thought that the serif was in a new in an unneeded decoration and it belongs to the past. I tend to agree with Fronzoni about San Serif. Uh, I, I in my work I feel like my hands are tied when I work with serif type uh, because I am personally interested in the ambiguity between geometric geometry and typography and when you do that serifs are in the way. So this is uh, uh, probably one of the most famous posters that uh, Fronzoni designed. He became very famous for this poster uh, 
for a, an exhibition on Lucio Fontana paintings. And uh, he was a little bit upset about this because uh, he, he, he was almost known for just this poster and he designed so many of them, but everybody recognized, it, recognized him because of this particular one. Uh, so in 1966, while the use of Sanseric was commonly used, of course, by many designers, mostly imported from Switzerland, uh, and uh, was adopted by many designers, Fronzoni took a few steps beyond. This level of aesthetic was disruptive and innovative. If you, if you can imagine 1966. Um, so uh, it's, uh, it's kind of uh, a little bit unpredictable, but uh, in my opinion, poetic at the same time. Uh, the, typo the, the typographic <coughs> representation of Lucio Fontana art is reproduced brilliantly and with an extreme synthesis that perfectly portrays Fontana's painting. And this is his actual painting of Lucio Fontana. Slashing, slashing the canvas. Uh, this is... Uh, uh, by the way, Fonzoni worked mostly uh, for culture and the arts. So uh, he, he was very coherent in his being committed to work for culture and, uh, and the arts. And uh, so what you see here are many posters. They are all related to either you know, cultural, cultural events or uh, art exhibits. This is uh, uh, a, a, a poster for a show of Mauro Reggiani, who is uh, sort of like our Italian Mondrian. Uh, he's interpreted his own minimal uh, graphic design style. The line creates a perfect geometry with a square. The gray line of type underneath is treated more like a geometric object than a line of type. And uh, I, I think that, uh, you know, if, if you think about uh, uh, a poster like this, in the middle of the 1960s, the explosion of color that was going on in the, in the 1960s was definitely disruptive uh, <coughs> just because of that. Uh, so, Fronzoni, again, talking about color, Fronzoni said, the color is us and our world, but the graphics should remain black and white. And this is the painting where I think he was inspired by, uh, by Reggiani. Uh, here's another poster from uh, Sonia Delaunay. Uh, this poster was for an ex exhibition in Milan. Her colorful art elements became Fronzonian in the sense that uh, it was a strip of all color, of course, and it was all black and white. And, uh, but uh, the power of graphics helped to identify and remember the iconic shapes and the movement of, uh, that were a little bit of the trademark of the artist. And here you see actual his uh, Sonia Delaunay painting. Uh, this is called Rhythm Color uh, from 1964. And uh, you know, she was actually called the Queen of Color. So it's, uh, it's funny to see the queen of color in black and white. <clears throat> uh, these are uh, a, another statement he made. Symmetry belongs to the past, while asymmetry is modern because it is dynamic and a fixed point for contemporary design. What has been done is not only not modern, it is a mirror of a non-advanced society. So this poster is, uh, is called Un Raggio di Sole, A Rays of Sun. So he actually gave us color. He, he made an exception. So sometimes he would surprise us because he said he would just do everything black and white, everything sunset, but sometimes he would actually contradict himself. And uh, uh, this is just actually a ray, a ray of sun and uh, could probably pick up a little bit of the yellow there. Um, 
and uh, uh, he said we must use form or color only when they are necessary for the comprehension. I would think that this is uh, this is an example of a piece that uh, is intellectually elegant, as Massimo would have said. And this again is another another contradiction where uh, this is a, a poster for antiquarian art, and uh, he used serif type, but it's in fragments, so. It's not really, it, it's really shapes, uh, but it's, it's sort of an exception. Um, he said, I think the task of each of us is to bring culture, not where it already exists, but where it is missing, in the provinces, in the suburbs, to the poorest, where there is less information. The culture of a country is measured by the culture of the last person of that country. And it is the average that counts. The task and duty of every person is to advertise culture. He also said, without culture, design does not exist. So these are uh, other fantastic posters uh, that are uh, uh, for for uh, bringing culture. So he, he was very coherent in what he was preaching, uh, because these are posters to bring uh, culture to factory workers. So it, 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 the, the way I read this is, uh, you know. I read it in, in different ways. I don't know, maybe everybody sees different things, but what I see is uh, the voices of the factory workers, some whispering, some talking louder. I see typography as the workers themselves, as clusters of people walking down the streets. But I also, since this is uh, it's about uh, pianist concertos, uh, I see the rhythm of music and the concert of uh, pianists. And so uh, this high culture is uh, communicated uh, in, is, is much in keeping with Franzoni, what he was believing in, which is bringing the highest culture uh, to, to the factory workers who possibly had less uh, access. So, uh, you know, when I was reading this article by uh, Heller, he's, he, he, he named basically from Zoni austere minimalism. And on this point, I do not agree with this term. I personally see a lot of uh, poetry here. And to me, this is just visual poetry. And to do poetry, one must be committed to do poetry and it must have the sole scope of making poetry. And I can say that that's what he was doing on a daily basis, and he was very committed to it. <clears throat> we need to aim to essential things, to remove every redundant effect, every useless flowering, to elaborate a concept on mathematical basis, on fundamental ideas, on elementary structures. We strongly need to avoid waste and access, uh, excess. This is a poster for a poster designer, Michele Spera, and he created this S uh, and uh, uh, created this thick and thin, which was the trademark of, uh, of this uh, graphic designer. And it was an exhibition of the posters of this other graphic designer, and he designed the poster for the show. And so here is. I show an example of, uh, of his work and how he was reduced. Uh, basically, he was making this is kind of like his thick and thin composition that became his trademark, but from zoning reduced it to this simplicity. And this poster is another very famous poster by Fronzoni, and it's about uh, it's called Urban Sign, and it's just pure. 
pure visual power. Uh, this poster is about art and science, and he, with this uh, uh, typographic composition, he created almost a 3D effect. And uh, so, uh, so this uh, this poster is probably one of the most radical approach, and uh, uh, so uh, this poster was for a symposium for uh, interlingual research. So inten he intentionally trimmed the type to the point of illegibility. Not only it is conceptually meaningful, as you have to practice linguistic research starting from the poster. By the way, he probably six point type on the on the uh, right hand bottom. You have all the information you need. So if you want to find the information, it's there. But it's uh, very provocative to have something that is illegible. Um, and um, uh, but uh, 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 Fronzoni captured the reader in a way that that. Uh, very, very powerful. And uh, once uh, you, you see this, you don't forget it just because it's so engaging. And so he wanted to surprise and uh, on an emotional and I think it's, it's a very memorable uh, piece because of that. He figured that viewers were more interested in getting emotions rather than getting much information. And finally, this is uh, uh, the last poster that I'm showing, and then we're moving on to another section of the presentation. But uh, this is uh, in 1993. Uh, this poster was for the uh, exhibit in New York City of the Reinhold, Reinhold Brown Gallery. Uh, so for, for, for the first time in 1993, people had the chance to see Fronzoni's work in the US. and. Uh, Fronzoni here is almost subversive and, and provocative. He pushes the convention again. He does it with elegance going outside of the boundaries. So I don't know if you can understand how this works, mm -hmm. but it's a poster where the type protrudes outside of the poster. And so it's die cut outside. And so he's doing just what he's talking about, where all of the space where normally people use to have the content is left blank. So, um, so uh, the MoMA came to the ex to the exhibition and basically bought half of the exhibition, and so. Uh, all of these posters from that exhibition are a permanent collection of the Museum of Modern Art. So I just wanted to say uh, something that uh, uh, that uh, I, I asked directly to Agi Fronzoni. When you focus on your project on extreme minimalism, don't you find it potentially limiting at times? And his answer was, geometry is infinite. So that was very, very inspiring, because it just gave me a lot of inspiration just thinking about that. Uh, so in context, I just wanted to have, I, Armando Milani gave me this, uh, this picture, and he told me the story, a little bit of the story behind it. They're running a workshop together Armando and Massimo Vignelli, and uh, uh, Massimo Vignelli, uh, he fam famously said, out of thousands of typefaces, all you need are a few basic ones and trash the rest. Mm -hmm. So uh, according to Armando, when they laid out the six that their choice typefaces that uh, Massimo believes are the ones to use, then Armando started saying, well, you know, you use Optima for this project here. And, and so they made exceptions, joking around, and they, they went beyond with some 
other fonts like Gilsan, Primozoan, and uh, Optima, and some other ones. Uh, so in case of an emergency, you can go beyond the six. But anyway, uh, I, I put it in context here because I think that the views of uh, Massimo Vignelli about type in general, there are already a kind of radical uh, position. And so imagine going beyond that and just uh, restricting it just uh, sans serif. And I think uh, Fonzoni was just uh, pretty much um, uh, using Avenir, Helvetica, Universe, Futura, but all very similar sans serif. So, uh, <clears throat> moving on from uh, uh, you know old culture of uh, of uh, Fonzoni to uh, a very very commercial conversation about uh, something that I stumbled upon teaching branding, um, and uh, I think that uh, it, it's basically uh, fashion brands one after the other. Uh, little by little in the last few years, and I'm giving examples of how they remove a narrative from their logotype and logo marks. Mm -hmm. Either they were removed completely, uh, so there was a reason for uh, historically why they had uh, certain icons on certain, uh, certain graphics, certain marks, and they all went one after the other, uh, removing their, their graphics and narrative and uh, going all sans serif. And uh, uh, this is uh, uh, Cassandra, 1962, designed this very iconic graphic. But, you know, the, the fashion brands, it is not with us anymore, so <coughs> they removed the, the first name. But, uh, but basically, it's, it's very interesting <coughs> that they all went, all caps, sans serif, and uh, uh, and uh, uh, so they, they remove their heritage, and their heritage brand remains just uh, uh, for, for the products, but not in their communications. And I have a theory that uh, uh, when, you, when you have uh, these kinds of graphics, it's not in the way of the narrative. So they, they separate uh, the, the graphics is, is very, very clean and uh, completely wi without any kind of uh, uh, connection. It's the most simple uh, form of graphics. But then there is the part that is uh, emotional underneath it, and there are two separate things. And uh, uh, a, a more expressive typography would have been in the way of the kind of more emotional and, and uh, narrative part. So same thing in their uh, videos here. Uh, the, the, the graphics is so simple. And uh, thank you. And uh, uh, it uh, allows for the content to... Uh, and uh, have its own impact that way. But um, uh, the chairman CEO, Bernard Arnault, uh, former uh, CEO of LVMH, a huge successful luxury group, said, I like, what I like is to feel the emotion. And I agree even more when I see sales result close. So he's talking very much about the emotion in their communication. And uh, so when you see them all together, it's really remarkable how it, it's almost as if they uh, all got into the same boardroom and decided to do the same thing. Um, I want to show, uh, this is my work. Uh, it's the logo that I've done for a uh, popular club in, in 
West Chelsea, New York City. I don't know if any of you were there at the time, but uh, it was uh, uh, an attempt for uh, reducing form and, uh, uh, and just go to the minimal essence uh, of uh, uh, visual power. Uh, and so I am just showing this going back to the conversation of Fonzoni because the reason why I felt so close to his work is that even before I met Fonzoni, I was already trying to do these kinds of things. And I think that this is probably similar to what uh, Fonzoni would have approached a uh, mark. Uh, and then I would like to show you this, which is the more recent work that I did for uh, a, uh, a, a former a light bulb factory in, in uh, Toronto. And uh, this is, uh, uh, I have to say, I was influenced by Fronzoni here because uh, this is after I met Fronzoni. And I c when I was thinking about light bulbs and lights, all I could think of was the poster of the ray of sun and uh, the beam of sun and uh, the representation of light with this very, very thin line that represents the L. But since this is a, uh, a branding and wayfinding for the whole <coughs> building, uh, I like this sort of situation where by tilting the L, it becomes like a, a uh, directional signage. Uh, and so here you go with uh, black is left and white is right. And uh, these are some of the applications. And uh, the, the system carries on here with this. Uh, it's a very, very long corridor, and it's very hard to identify where the elevator is. And so this is really down to the very, very essence. And still using this L uh, tilted on its side, but it acquires a completely different meaning. And here is your on tour three, clearly. So. Uh, uh, these are also some rugs that I designed. And again, on my mind, it was always uh, how to uh, create something that was uh, a uh, simple and complex. And uh, uh, so uh, trying to find the balance. At the time, I was thinking, I want to find the balance between chaos uh, and uh, order. And, uh, Chaos meaning complexity, and it's a little bit messier, uh, but a lot more narrative. But uh, on the other hand, the simplicity, more clarity, pragmatic, and then emotional. So you know, I was trying to find a balance, thinking that that was the perfect balance of communication. So. Uh, uh, Moving on, um, Times Square, um, you know, I've been teaching at uh, Parsons School of Design in New York, and, uh, and uh, uh, I think that uh, teaching is about learning, and uh, students are learning, but faculty are learning a great deal as well, and uh, I'm always learning from my students. My class, on average, looks like a UN nation gathering. So if there is a place where you can experience multiculturalism at its best in New York, is New York City. So in my class, I have a presentation for countries from all over the world. Everyone brings something to the table. And I learned so much over the years about all different cultures. So everyone comes from different traditions, different backgrounds, different upbringing. But one thing that I realize is that we're all made of the same OS, operating system. And in a sense, uh, we, we all respond to certain things. And uh, uh, we can execute our work differently based on our collective memory, based on our, our experience. We can agree of, uh, on fundamental levels of aesthetic and beauty, which most of us aspire to create. 
and is objective and not subjective. So there, there, there are certain things, and this is where I think, uh, you know, I, I want to, to go back a little bit about uh, <coughs> cognitive uh, uh, and memory and the brain, uh, because it is uh, proven now that uh, an overload of information is actually uh, counter uh, productive in the sense that uh, it's counterproductive in the sense that uh, uh, when there is too much information, uh, our brains shut down. So it's uh, this is why I show this because it's almost like a self-defense mechanism. So when you are subject to so much, uh, you just don't absorb anything. And uh, if you have, uh, if you're we are able as communicators to synthesize the information, then we can absorb that, that much more. Um, we have a, a, a greater capacity of memorizing the, the work. So, um, in, uh, in the spirit, of uh, uh, the idea of uh, design is one, I would like to show some uh, product design as another example of, uh, of how we as practitioners uh, are sometimes influenced by what we're offered as the typology of projects. So the typology of project can also be a big part in deciding how important certain topics are. And as a result, the outcome is uh, uh, re responding to that request. So, uh, so uh, the project, uh, uh, you know, so uh, this is my collection of ashtrays. I've been passionate about that. Just curious about uh, the idea that uh, you know, there was no respectable designer in the 60s that was not commissioned uh, to design an ashtray. And uh, I find these three examples all based on very simple forms, round or cube, however, so much personality. So, um, one is uh, Alan Fletcher's uh, famous clamshell uh, uh, ashtray, which uh, houses dozens of cigarettes. Um, uh, then the, the one in the, the one in on the left, the one in the center is Achille Castiglioni, is uh, with, with that spring and uh, uh, kind of inspired by found objects that he was really very involved in. And the one on the right is uh, Bruno Munari with his elegant uh, and intelligent uh, structure inside, but just a very simple orange cube. And it's quite fascinating how it's inconceivable to have a large production of ashtrays today or having someone embracing this kind of typology of projects. So uh, just uh, as a reaction, uh, uh, I'm showing a couple of vases by Ettore Sotsas, and uh, this was uh, uh, a, a reaction to what uh, the postmodernist uh, designers felt uh, unemotional. It was, a, it was a, an unemotional design period of the 70s, and uh, so in the 80s they unleashed everything that was emotional and, uh, you know, breaking this, what, uh, what they deem a little bit too serious and uh, make, make themselves uh, a little bit, uh, tease themselves with humor and being transgressive and being a bit on emotion, introducing a, a, a new exciting language. Uh, these are so colorful by, and they're joyful, toy-like. Uh, Ettore Sotsas completely forgot about functions 
and fell in love with materials and the forms. And um, uh, the people that had these vases don't even, even use them as vases, but they're just simply like sculptures. So, um, but uh, he, he created something of curiosity and objects that create an emp empathic relationship and a pleasure uh, with happy, happy objects. So, uh, fast forwarding today is uh, this typology of, project, of, uh, of products. Uh, there's a sort of blending in, in my opinion. Uh, they are perfect, precise, they're correct from an industrial uh, design point of view, uh, well planned and well elaborated, but they're superficial and they leave me completely indifferent. There is no depth, there is no soul, there is no personality or emotion. Um, so as a uh, provocative uh, conversation, I have picked this image. Uh, these are Tibetan prayer wheels for spreading spiritual blessing and well-being. And uh, perhaps this is what we need to redesign today, objects whose function is simply to make us think, feel good, and spreading well-being. The subject in itself will generate tons of emotions. If designers would embrace today the idea of interpret feelings, a series of objects would come out that are full of narrative and depth and not of superficiality. This would be a big jump forward. And uh, I would like to leave you with this phrase and when Massimo Vignelli was my teacher, and he would uh, end the class, leave the class, would just say to the class, keep it simple but complex. Thank you, Jonathan. Uh, we have time for questions, so please, if you have any. Fronzoni's posters. If I think about a, the size of a Swiss poster, the Italian posters were they that large? Uh, Seventy by one hundred. Uh, they they vary in size, uh, but uh, they are mostly <coughs> seventy by one hundred centimeters, which is the standard format of Italian paper. Some of them were smaller. Some of them were uh, maybe offset. Some of them were uh, serigraphs. Uh, so there's a the gamut, but uh, most of them were uh, pretty large size, like the Swiss posters, yeah. Yeah. Nothing like seeing them in real life. I mean, it was fabulous to see them with this, with this uh, projection, but uh, when you see the physical thing, it's something else. often tend to try and remove, at least in a modern and contemporary way, we try to remove as much as we can and simplify. Um, and the example that you have with the fashion houses is really powerful because I think a lot of us in my generation grew up with certain logos that came from the 90s and 2000s that were very involved and characteristic um, that have kind of evolved into a more simplified version. And I think a lot of people have a very strong emotional reaction to certain characters or things being removed. And I was wondering if you thought that this removal is totally necessary, or if the character that was present in some of these older logos is a function in and of itself. Uh, well, there's been... Uh, uh, Unfortunately, uh, some of the brilliant logos, for instance, by Paul Rand, were completely redone, like the UPS logo. I remember when that was redesigned, the whole design community was uh, in tears uh, because uh, uh, a 
at some point it was kind of fashionable in the 90s to create all of these logos with the 3D effect. I think that people uh, have, uh, were enamored by uh, what the computer could do and creating these three-dimensional with the little shadows and everything. But if you really analyze those logos, uh, and people are realizing now how ineffective they are, and from a pure uh, visual perception, they're, they're weak. And uh, so I think that the, uh, you know, to answer your question, yes, I think that the simpler, the better, because, because uh, they last much longer. The logo type, the logo mark, uh, should, should last a very, very long time because you cannot change it all the time. It's, it's extremely laborious and expensive for a corporation to change a, a mark. Uh, and so that should last for a very long time. It should not be fashionable. But you realize that the brand is uh, comprised of many, many different elements. And the logo, logo type, logo mark, is just one of the expressions in the middle of a very complex construction. And so, uh, you know, everything that surrounds the, the mark is very flexible. You can change everything around the mark. So if you keep the mark simple, it lasts for a long time and you can do everything else surrounding it. That's my take. But, but excellent question. Thank you. I would give the same answer as from Zoni. Geometry is infinite. <laughs> uh, in a sense that uh, even in its simplicity, I, I don't know what you mean by doing all the same. Uh, and, uh, but um, I mean, in the, the example that I gave with the fashion brands, um, everything that's, it, it, it's interesting because it's, it's very subtle and uh, uh, even in the Sanseri family, Balenciaga is a little bit more condensed, and they did that because the, the, uh, you know, the name is very long, and so they condensed it a little bit, but it has a very different character than Chanel, let's say, or you know, the, 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 the graphics is different just by the, the letter formation. So it has a, its unique identity just by the letters that it represents. But then also, the, the whole narrative of the company is endless. So, uh, yes, I think that uh, it's, it's not a bad idea to not have too much expressive quality in the mark, in the, in the graphics, the main graphics, and let it be everywhere else. You can change it all the time. Maybe adding on to that question, um, I wonder how much Franzoni was thinking about the context that his posters were going in, for example, as a response or reaction or resistance to the color that you mentioned in the 60s, or like the example you gave of Times Square, um, or if he wasn't really thinking about the context at all and this was just his, his unique expression. He was a bit of a provocateur, and he was a real intellectual, money, he worked exclusively for the culture, uh, and, uh, and so uh, he could do whatever he wanted. Uh, you know, that, that kind of approach would apply in the corporate world, for sure. We couldn't possibly do that. But uh, he was very coherent in his thoughts, and, and I think that this is why he turned out to be so powerful as an educator. I mean, I think that he influenced so many people in the field. Uh, I think that he was very aware of uh, pure uh, visual communication. 
and uh, how it affects uh, and how one perceives information. Uh, and uh, uh, during that time, in the 60s and 70s, designers were very, uh, there was a lot of conversation about visual perception. And uh, so, you know, this is why uh, a lot of designers used Helvetica, and they, they were all talking about what is the most legible font, uh, is it uh, sans serif, serif, you know, there was a lot of conversation about all of these issues. Um, but uh, I don't know if I answer your question in some ways. Uh, I just wanted to know what's your favorite typeface, or like something that you use a lot. Uh, I'm in the camp of uh, of sans serifs. I think uh, Adamir is very very clean. Uh, Futura and uh, Universe, mm -hmm. all of these sans serif uh, type, just because they are very geometric. Uh, a friend of mine, uh, Charles Nix, I was saying before. Uh, redesigned Futura called Futura Now, and I strongly recommend it because Futura was designed as a uh, you know more of an intellectual concept of geometry, but when it comes down to usability, it is challenging, and so people have uh, over the over the years tried to improve it somehow and make it more usable. But one is Avenir, which uh, which is the the translation of Futura in French to, to become sort of like the future. And, uh, 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 but, uh, uh, but I think that uh, Charles Nix did an excellent job with Futura now. So check it out if you haven't seen it. Go ahead. So um, I definitely understand the whole push to minimalism, especially with the logos and stuff. is space for, I guess, the traditional logo, especially when considering um, you know, different markets, say in like Asia or whatever, that like can't, like don't read the words and stuff. Um, I'm just wondering, so if all these brands and whatever push towards this minimalistic lettering instead of like traditional, like you said, the UPS logo or whatever, um, if that will affect other cultures uh, will be able to recognize these brands and stuff like that? Uh, you know, I, I worked in Asia for uh, 10 years, about 10 years, and uh, <clears throat> I was always looking for the equivalent of Futura in Chinese because I was working with Chinese fonts, and uh, it's, uh, I, I found it. I found uh, a real excellent translation of a sans-serif font. Um, yeah, I think that uh, that is the challenge of the designer to really, that there's so many ways that you can do it. I mean, I, I think that the, the example that I gave, uh, it's quite extreme and it's quite remarkable that everybody went in that direction, but it's to make a point. But I think that uh, even within the modern Temporary and minimal uh, space. So there's a lot of room for creativity and to make it distinctive. That's what I think. And, and uh, you know, when it comes down to is visual perception and uh, almost like a primordial way of absorbing uh, the information. And so uh, th this is why I was uh, I, I was talking about co cognitive. Uh, you know memory and, uh, and the way that you absorb information. There is a sort of uh, a natural way that we all respond to the same way. So the simpler, the better. And we, within that uh, simplicity, the world is, is it's open. There is a, it's really up to the creativity of the designer. And there is a lot of room for, for all kinds of uh, interpretation of that.
more so hyper commercialized uh, society uh, these days, or do you think it's possible to still, to, as a designer, to be uh, you know provocative and to be more aligned with the culture and the art than uh, you know to be concerned with you know the monetary aspect and and the business side of things. Uh, th yeah, that's a challenging. That, that's the, the one thing that is challenging. He, he could do these kinds of radical design just because he didn't belong to, he didn't subscribe to any, and uh, you know, he, if, if, uh, if he, he, he couldn't do what he wanted to do, he would just drop it and, and do something else. But there is uh, always uh, a way to push the boundaries, even within a corporate uh, environment. And uh, as a designer, you have a lot of power to, to do that and to present designs that are, uh, you know, not to conforming to a more of an average approach. Um, by the way, I just wanted to, to s say something that I meant to say before about Franzoni, that <coughs> while he's largely unknown worldwide, in Italy, among designers, uh, people know who he is and uh, who he was. And uh, uh, last year, he was 100, uh, celebrated 100 uh, anniversary of his birth. Uh, he was born in 1923. And there was an event at the Triennale Museum. Uh, and uh, so many people came and spoke, mostly his uh, students. And uh, they all took something from him, and, uh, uh, and in fact, there is also a term that when uh, you, in, in Italian, among graphic designers, that when you uh, design something similar to Fronzoni, it's Fronzoniano. It's a little bit uh, like uh, uh, picking up on that uh, approach. And there, there are some designers that actually are very, very much following his school, and it, it, their work almost but they are continuing that, that kind of tradition. Let's see, we have time for one more question, if there's another one out there. I, I, I just want to say something about, uh, <coughs> you know, if I can make a, uh, a parallel to architecture, uh, you know, the modernist movement from the 1920s, 1930s, International style, flat roof, white buildings. Uh, you know, th these people were visionaries, and uh, but uh, sometimes they didn't have the uh, technical abilities to realize what they really wanted to achieve. And so, contemporary architects today are actually continuing that tradition and uh, taking it to another level. Uh, and uh, and are actually doing what they would have liked, but uh, there wasn't the technology. There wasn't. And I, I think that likewise, with, with graphic design, that there are these masters that have put something out there. And uh, it, it's wonderful that people actually take it further and see how far we can go and to explore moving forward. Well, I think that's a great statement to leave us with tonight. Jonathan, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you all for coming. Thank you. And please keep an eye open for our next lecture uh, next month, which will be uh, Free Day uh, Marib. And uh, we're looking forward to seeing you then. Have a great night, everyone. <laughs>